afternoon and warm welcome to whoever is joining in the last stretch of uh, women in entrepreneurship panel here so as we know female founded and female led startups are becoming a common place but we know this this is still accounts for a very small fraction of startups worldwide and according to the latest report by forbes uh, women co-founded 20% of startups and joined male female founder teams received 14.9% of vc dollars in 2022 so i'm really honored here today to be part of this panel and engage in discussion about each of our following panelists entrepreneurial journeys and i'm joined by three amazing panelists who were determined to take this entrepreneurship route and um, so we have uh, on my very left, Darshita Chaturvedi, who is a co-founder and CEO of Atri Labs. She did her undergraduate studies from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and dropped out of MIT Sloan to pursue her passion, uh, Atri Labs. And Atri Lab today is a Y Combinator-backed startup. Then we have Susan Conover, co-founder and CEO of Piction Health. She holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from University of Texas, Austin, and a master's in system design and management from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and also a master's in engineering product development from Singapore University. She's also recognized by Forbes as Forbes Next Thousand. And we have Zara Perumal, who's a co-founder and CTO of Overwatch Data. She also holds a bachelor's in computer science and master's in artificial intelligence from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I think that's common among the three <laughs> panelists, uh, MIT. Uh, she's also featured in this year's Forbes 30 Under 30. Really proud of you. Yeah, <laughs> and Overwatch Data is a Y Combinator backed startup too. So without further ado, I would not steal their thunder and talk about their companies and let these amazing women talk about their companies. So let's start with Darshita. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Darshita. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Atri Labs. Uh, as Arushi mentioned, we are in the current Y Combinator batch. Uh, so I basically flew from San Francisco to be here. So really happy to see you all here. Um, yeah, um, a little bit about my company. Uh, we are building an open source Python web framework. Um, companies like Meta use us to build their internal machine learning web applications. AI companies, which you're hearing a lot of, uh, the AI companies are using us to uh, build their flagship web applications. Um, so anyone here, if you say you want to build your portfolio website or any kind of web application, reach out to me. We are basically building open source company. Uh, so yeah, it's free to get started. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Susan Conover, co-founder and CEO of Fiction Health. We run a virtual first dermatology clinic. Um, it, it's virtual first, so we take cases from wherever you are, at whatever, whenever you have a problem, uh, in like hair, skin, and nail issues. And um, we actually recently did a vertical integration. So we launched a derm clinic in New Hampshire in December and Connecticut in January. And yesterday, we opened our Massachusetts clinic. Thank you. <laughs> it's an exciting week. Um, but we, uh, it, it's the, it was, we're at a data science event, so I should explain the context. Um, <laughs> we've built the largest database of photos of skin diseases by partnering with over 200 dermatologists in more than 20 different countries, including South Africa, India, Spain, uh, Bolivia, to create a data set that's representative across all skin tones, which certainly doesn't exist today. And, um, and our AI is on par with a dermatologist. So the value we provide is high quality care and scalable dermatology care. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Zara. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm super excited to be here today. And I can't wait to come back in five years and see what all of you are doing then. Uh, I am a CTO and founder at Overwatch Data. Uh, we're an enterprise technology platform that looks at events across news, social media, dark web, uh, climate, natural disasters, and tries to surface uh, risks or opportunities to businesses uh, so they can see the events that matter to them and why. 
so for example, uh, a payments company might look and see like what regulation changes might impact their industry, or if there's tactics on the deep web that are being discussed that, of how uh, people might attack their systems. Uh, on the other side, we look at things like how is the supply chain impacted by like big global events like the Russia-Ukraine war, um, local events like, like protests near a mine. Uh, so generally, we're trying to just kind of uh, look at this problem of like how do these risks uh, um, cause waste and inefficiencies, and uh, how can we sort of quiet this the incredibly large amount of data that's out there that impacts these companies and sort of. Uh, quiet the noise and some of this data and make it actionable. Oh, great. Thank you all for sharing. Now let's go a little bit deeper into all of your journeys. So we all know the unique challenges entrepreneurship being. So what motivated you to choose this career path or what was that sort of pivotal moment that that's when you decided, no, I want to pursue entrepreneurship. We can start with Susan. Absolutely. So, um, I had worked in management consulting and seen a few friends from undergrad or in that environment start companies. And so I actually moved to Boston earlier than my uh, master's degree started to, and worked with a couple of startups. Um, but I think like that grad school environment sort of taught me, you know, I took classes on entrepreneurship. So I felt more confident in making that decision. Um, um, but then I think also, so I was diagnosed with melanoma when I was 22 and I tried to go see a dermatologist and was told it would take at least three months to get in. And so I went to my primary care doctor who biopsied my mole and it ended up being a stage two. So if I had waited, I don't know if I would still be here. And so I spent my thesis at MIT going deep in that topic and the more I learned, the more I realized um, patients really aren't the center of healthcare. It's always the marketing message, but ultimately decisions are made more for pharma or health insurance or doctors or you know every other stakeholder. And so I just realized like no one's actually going to solve this problem for patients with patients at the center. And so just decided to take the opportunity to, you know, go deep in my uh, degree in those topics and sort of felt the confidence to, to make the leap after um, graduating. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, I, so for me, I, I think I'm generally pretty idealistic. Uh, and I think I often throughout my career look for things where I feel like I can have the most positive impact on the world or maybe a training opportunity where I can do that. Uh, and I think, let me take a step back on like where I first wanted to found a startup. I, when I was 12, I learned to write iPhone apps after the original iPhone launch, so it's dating me a little bit. Uh, but I, I think there was something I loved where there is the opportunity for to use my STEM and like computer science and engineering skills, but it was also so creative. Like you look throughout the world and you try to find some problem that you can solve and you build it and you get to talk to users, you talk to your family and, and you, you try to just kind of build something from nothing. And so I think that's where I first fell in love with the idea of someday like building something or building my own technology company. Uh, and then years went by, I went through like a, did bioinformatics for a while and landed in this sort of intersection of machine learning and cybersecurity. And I think when I left my job again last summer to, to found this, it was, it was sort of for the same reasons. I, I think I looked at where I was and, and I love the mission of what we were working on and, and my team was incredible and it was, uh, everything was kind of, uh, you know, on paper looked really good. Uh, but I looked around and I realized that my, they sort of needed someone like me or someone like with my skills on paper, but they didn't need kind of everything that, you know, my personality, my unique interests, sort of what I brought to the table. And so I felt like as a founder, I had the opportunity to kind of use all of my skills. And if it went well, then I would have a huge opportunity for leverage and impact on the world. And if it didn't go well, I would still learn so much from like all, you know, using everything I have and being forced to learn things like enterprise sales, which was not taught in the computer science degree. Um, so I, I think, you know, that that's sort of like where I came to this summer and uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. Yeah, uh, I relate so much to what Zara said, to what Susan said already. Um, I, like the short answer why I started, is why I started my own company is, uh, one of the lectures that I attended at Sloan, uh, the uh, 
professor basically said that Bill uh, Bill Ollett, the professor um, in the Martin Trust of uh, Trust Center of Entrepreneurship. I'm giving a lot of unnecessary details. Sorry, but basically, <laughs> basically, what he said was entrepreneurship is not a spectator sport. And that was the time when uh, I was exploring a lot of ideas. I was working on a side project that was becoming like a startup, uh, but I'd never thought that I would do a startup myself. Like I always felt that I was this risk averse person who would, uh, you know, this is not the field for me. Like all my friends were thinking about doing it, but I was, you know, watching them from sidelines. Um, so yeah, I think that was the, um, that was like that one statement um, was the reason why I dropped out, the reason why I took this big leap of starting my own company. Um, having uh, having co-founders who, who really believe in you and whom you really believe in helps a lot uh, because every single time I'd seen my friends uh, thinking of being a startup but actually not ending up taking the leap was because they were not either confident on the team or the idea that they wanted to pursue. but. That was the first time last year when I felt that I was A, going to work on an idea that was very technically challenging. So that was you know, definitely a, the drive behind any engineer. Uh, B, I was very uh, privileged and blessed to have found my co-founder who, for whatever reason, believed so much more than me than I believed in myself. <laughs> and a third was this motivation that uh, I was, yeah, if I, if I wanna do, if I want to start a company, then I cannot be a spectator anymore. I'll have to take the leap. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what happened. Um, yeah, that's the shorter version of it, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, three of you. I, I think I've personally felt uh, talking to a lot of women through women in data science and in general that it doesn't come naturally to women to pursue entrepreneurship and uh, uh, from where I belong, personally, uh, in Indian societies, it is not seen as a traditional route that women would take. Uh, so, yeah, I can relate to your story, uh, Darshita. So, switching gears a little bit, I also wanted to uh, know and let our audience know what role did your genders play in uh, entrepreneurial journey and be it when you want, went to solicit fund to VCs or when you were uh, seeing yourself one in 100 women networking opportunities and things like that. So we can start with Zara. Yeah, I think for me, um, I think in general, I've been incredibly lucky. I, I think to, to what Abushi said, there, there's some very real challenges for women in engineering in engineering in general, um, and also as founders, where I think you know what 1.9% of uh, people who received venture capital funding last year were women founders. And I think even in NYC, like there's only about I don't know 14 or something. Don't don't fact check me on that. Uh, <laughs> like percent of the founders are women. Yeah, something something relatively low. Less and than that's, 20. And that's just that's just founders. That's not specifically CEOs. Yeah, the that, numbers yeah. are even smaller yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think with with that said, I think throughout my journey, I I've been really lucky, and, and some of it was like very intentional and like you know paranoid when I looked for teams of like having teams that were very supportive. Uh, women, uh, you know, diverse people in, in general, uh, and, and I feel like so to some extent I was able to like avoid some of the challenges I saw my friends uh, face. Uh, I think there there are sort of like small things like, you know, I, I whenever I sit down at the table and I tell people I'm the CTO, they're like, oh really? You sure? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's on the patch. Uh, but and, and I think other things like um, you know, for my personality and and this is a, maybe a little bit gendered, but. I, I tend to, I like to think before I, I say something, like I, I need time to process. And I think other people uh, tend to think as they're saying something, or in some cases think before they say something. So I think it was for me like learning to make sure I contribute to the conversation has been something that's been my journey and hopefully something I'm getting better at is jumping in and making sure I have uh, impact with my ideas. Um, but I think to uh, what I should have said, with, with having these supportive co-founders, I, I think it's it's something that's been really exciting for me and in our company is, you know, I, usually as, as the woman on the team, you have to be the first one to be like, we should also hire a woman or, or we should look for a, a female on our board. And my two co-founders like are aggressive, like allies where they're, they're like, you know, how are we going to make sure we have like awesome women engineers on our team from day one? And so I think that, that that's something that's, I think, helped um, and has been pretty fun for me. 
Yeah, I mean, every uh, women founder's experience varies a lot. And some are, you know, more privileged than the other in terms of, I mean, it. it's sometimes you choose people who would be allies. Sometimes you just, by chance, meet yeah. people who become your allies. But basically, um, most days, you just care about your company. You don't you forget that you are like a woman founder uh, building your technology company. But some days, for example, in in, in my case, uh, and this this is this is an example that I shared with Arushi. Um, I went to speak at a conference, and this was a tech conference. Uh, and and for a product like ours, we generally have to go and you know talk about how we built a product, how we built a specific part of the product, what we learned uh, in the journey. So I was one of these speakers. My co-founder was also with me, and we were after after the conference. We were hanging out. We were just uh, talking to all the attendees, and one of the attendees basically uh, started discussing some business partnership related things with my co-founder, who is the CTO. And my CTO was basically trying to redirect this person and be like, "Hey, all the business decisions are going to be made by this person who is standing next to me. Don't talk to me about it." But basically, there is this perception that um, it's the men who make the decisions, and even though you get allies who try to play their part, it's still difficult. But most days, you you tend to not dwell too much on the disadvantages that you might have, and you just try to focus on your work. But it doesn't mean that those uh, disadvantages don't exist. It's basically a coping mechanism in my own way. <laughs> You're just trying to kind of go through life without dwelling too much on things that you can't control. Regency would like to share something. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's hard to see or know um, exactly what I experience as a woman versus if I weren't, because I haven't had that experience <laughs> yet, I guess. Um, but, uh, but I'd say how I've seen it uh, most is in fundraising, is I'll be asked questions more on risk of like, or like what we've done to date rather than where we're going. But investors make decisions to invest based on opportunity and the future growth. And so um, I, for some, I have to learn. I'm still I'm in the process of learning how to answer a risk question with an opportunity answer. It's very hard. I'm not a uh, press White House correspondent, so. <laughs> Um, but but there are studies that show that if you can do that, you can like even out the odds and and raise way more. Um, and so I'm in the process of learning that and putting together a playbook for women who are fundraising. So if you guys want to work together, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and I'd say also just like certainly our first uh, machine learning hire is a woman. And uh, we, d we do try to be really intentional about hiring and putting together the right team because as I'm sure you guys know, like female founded uh, startups make more money. So we all want returns, right? <laughs> well, that's a great way to look, look at it. I think relating to Darshita's experience, I remember there was uh, one professor I was listening to. She's a founder of Incitro. Um, and she's been like 20, 21 years, uh, Stanford professor. And when she took her secretary into the conference room, everyone just simply assumed that he's the CEO of Incitro and she's not. And a lot of times uh, she, she shared these experiences that inherently we just start believing that, uh, that leadership uh, or uh, sort of CEO would be men. So thank you for sharing that. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad we have uh, such co-founders who want more, more women in team. So that, that, that's great. Um, next, uh, we would want to know what advice do you have for women or in general who are thinking of starting their own businesses and how can women entrepreneurs support and empower each other? So we can, we can take in any order. Susan, if you would like to go this first. This guide I'm making, we can, no. <laughs> um, so it's already been said on this panel before, uh, but I will repeat it. Uh, team and idea, make sure it's something you'll run through walls for, because you'll be faced with many a wall. Um, and um, 
Uh, and then team is like your co-founder, our early team, even if it's not officially a co-founder, um, makes a huge difference because when you have a low day, they can pick you up. When they have a low day, you can pick them up. And it it is a long game, right? Um, it's not just uh, sprints, even if uh, TechCrunch always makes it seem like <laughs> that. Um, and so I, I think those... But if you're like, I know this idea and where I can have, you know, what I can build as a competitive advantage and I have a person who shares my values and but complements my skills, then I think like those are the most important ingredients. Yeah, All of that resonates for like partner too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the things I have to say are very similar. Um, I, I think we've talked about on this panel this idea of like being risk averse, and I, I think I I am generally that way as well. Um, and, and also, I think there's a real thing like when you have a pretty good job, it's if you look risk adjusted on expected outcome of your salary, founding is probably not going to help with that. Like with the variance, it's going to go down. Um, so. I think I, I struggle with this, where I was like, I've always wanted to found a company, but then how can I, like, how do I justify this or make this a good idea? And I think to some extent that risk aversion, while well, we should all be more confident and just jump into it, but I also think it, it kind of can, is, is a hidden strength uh, for women, is, is that you can see some of the downsides, and so you have an opportunity to stack in your favor what you think would make a good company. And so for me, I think it was very similar to what Susan said, where I wanted a, a diverse founding team. I wanted people who had different skill sets than me, who maybe operations came easy to them, or business, or connecting with people. Um, I wanted the same values, so that when we decided if we were going to do something ethically questionable to like make more money, we would all say no very quickly. Uh, and I also think, for, for me, like. The other two things I looked for was one, like I, I knew my personality and like when there's something I love doing, I, I'll work so much harder at it. Like I, you know, I, and then you can work nights and weekends and while well, work-life balance is also super important, it's, it's fun for me in a way that it would be work for other people. And so finding that thing that I was that passionate about, I think just gives you a competitive advantage. Uh, and then my third thing is, is finding the thing that's like fits your unique interests. So I cared about machine learning and cybersecurity and I like, evolving environments, adversarial machine learning problems. And, and so finding that, that space where it is like the, not only is there product market fit, but also there's sort of a founder product fit where you're really playing to your strengths. And I think to me that was sort of, I was like, well, you know, it's checking my list of, of all the things that I think can de-risk this adventure. And so I, I think that helped me make the jump into it. Yeah, um, I'll just add on to like, team is really important. This is the uh, short short answer. How do you find that team? So my advice would be more around um, how do you create a bigger network so that you can find your potential co-founders? And it doesn't happen on one day. Like you don't go out, open the, the door to your apartment and be like, hey, does anyone want to co-found with me? You have to build a long-term relationships. So I think um, you find your potential co-founders co when you do side projects, when you do, um, when you work in academic labs, uh, basically anywhere w where you're basically, you, any time when you're working with uh, uh, someone else beyond you, uh, that you, you can look around and they can be your potential co-founders. So try to be in more of those situations would basically be my advice. Awesome. I, th I think I got the common theme here is core values, what work on, what do you actually care about? And one thing was common among three of you was finding the right co-founder. So very quickly, I, I would want to know where do you meet your co-founders? Uh, we can start with Zara. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I worked on a nonprofit right during my MN, um, and we were working on uh, cybersecurity for elections. And so we were working with state and local election officials and, and you know, helping just making the, some of the academic theory and best practices like very relatable. And so when I was working on that, I met Arjun. Um, and I didn't work super closely with him at the time. And I think I, I knew he works hard when he cares about you know, what feels like the mission of what he's doing is good. And I also knew he was like a really 
a gr like way too positive and friendly guy who was like you know loved his wife and just was like a really good person. Um, so I but I knew him a little bit, but it wasn't like he was my best you know best friend in life you know at the time maybe maybe now but <laughs> uh, but so I, I that's kind of how I, I got to know Arjun and then he when he told me about the startup this summer I, I didn't even know my third co-founder and so I had to sort of go through this like you know vetting process of trying to feel out really quickly. Um, you know, do we have the similar values? Do we have different stuff to bring to the table uh, before I, you know, jumped in with Tad as well? Uh, yeah, so I met my co-founder uh, in an improv class. In <laughs> The challenge with co-founder stories is they're all so different. Um, and But I was given advice um, by a y, y Combinator partner when I was originally trying to find a co-founder. And I implemented it, and it's incredibly helpful. Is like, you already know this person. You've already known them for years. They may be someone you went to high school with. They could be at a big company. They could be at a startup. Um, but like, think of the, the person who, not that you think would say yes, um, but who you think would be an equal, like a, like a thought partner with you and then do the like open, honest, heartfelt, I think you're the one for me. Let's figure this thing out together. Cause it is a very close relationship. I talk to my co-founder 10 times a day, maybe more than that. Um, and, uh, and I'm very lucky, right, that, um, that, that we figured out this pathway. But I do not think it's a hiring process where you're, like, looking for people with skills and reviewing resumes or posting on a mailing list, hey, I need a co I think I, I learned, like, at least that method worked for... For me, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how scalable these all of these solutions are, which is tricky. Yeah, yeah. it's it's funny finding your co-founder in an improv class looking for the same skill set to build dermatology labs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over to you, Darshita. Yeah, um, I met my co-founder during my undergrad years, uh, so I've known him for like ten years or so. Um, we were. We, we were not that close friends, yeah, like similar to what Zara said, like we were not best of friends, but um, yeah, I mean, I met him there, then we were in grad school, he was in Columbia, I was in MIT, so at least we were in East Coast, so we would, we would talk about uh, all the side projects that we wanted to do, we started doing a side project, I, as I mentioned, became a startup, so uh, yeah, that's basically the short story. Awesome. So, um, there's code debugging going on, you have to reply to investors, what's the progress, and there's more things where you have to go solicit funding or you have to recruit people. So how, how do you all manage or balance personal life with running uh, the demands of running a business? We can start with Zara. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I, I think it's a work in progress. Like, I'm always working on trying to make this a little bit better. Uh, I think one thing for me is, is there, I think it, it's easy, especially for, with my personality, to, to do the, like, your P0 most priority thing and just do it until it's done. And then, unfortunately, it's never done for the startup. Uh, so I think it's been something I've been learning of instead trying to do that, trying to think of, like, all the balls in the air, like, realistically, I'm just going to drop some of them. Like, there are some friends who I'd really want to see and... I convince them to do dinner together instead of like, you know, seeing them one on one. And, and there's some things that you just have to be real with yourself. You can't do everything. Um, but I, I think for me, it's like trying to figure out of all the balls that are in the air, like which ones, you know, if you drop them will bounce and which one if you drop them will break and trying to make sure like, you know, you spend time with your partner, you make time for the people that are like the really important people in your life. You make time to exercise all this a little bit and then also sleep. Um, so I, I think that's you know, where I've been doing it. Um, the other thing, I always love to plug this if anyone else is interested in surfing in Boston. Uh, but I learned to surf a year and a half ago and, and that was great for me because it was both like something I'm absolutely terrible at and got to get you know, comfortable learning something new. And I'm also forced to put away my phone. And it's like very, it's almost like meditative for me. I'm like out in nature, it's bigger than me. And so that's been a, a good work-life balance adventure. Yeah, work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, endless list of, list of tasks, but basically uh, you have to do ruthless prioritization. Um, it sucks sometimes, but in other days, uh, 
you realize that some of these tasks on the task list shouldn't be there in first yeah. place. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of work-life balance, uh, the other thing I would say is trying to find something that's completely unrelated to your day-to-day -day work. So um, I like to, I, I started painting. I, I have been really, really bad at it, but I'm still doing it because it's not competitive. Because I'm bad at it, I know that I'm not doing it for competitive reasons. I wouldn't ever put it on social media because it's so bad, but it's still very therapeutic. Uh, so yeah, that helps. Uh, <laughs> so funny. Uh, work in progress. Um, had to complete the trifecta. Um, so for me, yes, yeah, certainly the, the same idea is my sort of opinion of it is of the 100% of things you could be doing. Um, maybe like 2% of those, like filing your taxes or like things that help you have your company not die. And then on the other side, maybe like 3% of things are things you can do that like substantially change the direction and speed of your company in the next month. Um, and it's your job to figure out the middle, like 96% and make sure you're not doing that. That's like the hardest thing. Um, and then, you know, certainly, you know, it's discouraging if you're like, I want to do five things today and I only got one done. So always saying like, what's the most important thing for me to get all the way done today, which is just a good life tip. Um, but then like with the balance uh, on Friday at 5 p.m., my brain just like shuts off. So I never expect myself to work then, but I'm in, I still do improv. I wish I were better at it. <laughs> Uh, I aspire to be better at it, but um, I still do that. I'm part of a dodgeball league, which is fun, and I'm also not good at. Um, <laughs> uh, it's hard, yeah, it's hard to do things that you're not good at, but just be like, I'm here for the experience. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and just like, you know, values, right? My co-founder and I are both like family people, so we um, make sure to spend time with family and friends. Um, and try to respect each other's boundaries on that because we do have stuff that we have to handle sometimes on Saturday or Sunday or in the evening or whatever. Um, but it, yeah, it's a it's a balance, but it doesn't always feel like work um, because it's your dream, you know. Yeah, thank you for sharing and how beautifully and gracefully you all admitted. But I know how tough and hard it is to build anything ground up from scratch, so. Um, salute to your spirit, and we would now open for, for questions. If anyone has any questions, hi. Um, you talked about um, growing your um, meeting your co-founders and everything, and that being quite personal. But what about other key members of your early teams? Do you have? Do you? How do you find like? those people who are gonna provide, you know, like second, third tier of support, which I think is very important for making your company focus on the the 96%, not, you know, making sure you're not doing <laughs> what you're not supposed to be doing um, and finding the right people there. Like what networks, uh, you know, do you do you tap to find the other, those other re human resources, I guess? Yeah, for, for me at least, we do a lot of crawl, walk, run. So crawl version of hiring is like personal network, like post on LinkedIn, that sort of thing, and then other other tier, tiers of making that better and better. Um, but for us, yeah, one, our first machine learning hire, she's actually in Colorado, but she had like an advisor who was in Techstars, and we were in the Techstars Boston program, so that was incredibly helpful. Um, um, but it, it, hiring is incredibly important and also really hard because it's really tempting to like find someone right now. Um, I'll let you guys answer. Yeah, I think similarly it started with personal network and then went to all of the networks to look for good people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think for me, for like similarly we try to like have people like try us out and make sure they like us and we like them. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing I try to look for in hiring is is finding people who I think are sort of undervalued by their current job. Because I think there's a lot of people who are asked to do very 
I, in my opinion, this is hot takes, but I think they're asked to do very little and can do much more than they're, you know, they're capable of much more. And so for me, I think if we, if I can find those people, they will be much happier with us and, you know, we can see them grow and they can, you know, hopefully the whole company is going to grow. So it's grow with us. Um, so that's what I look for. Well, that's a smart way utilizing to their fullest potential. Yeah, I, I think I don't have that great answer here because we are super early. We haven't really hired anyone yet. Um, but in terms of the kind of people we want to hire, this I basically mentioned this to my co-founder really recently that we want to hire people who don't get the opportunity that they, that they would uh, that that other people would get in their existing jobs. So, um, yeah, that's basically being my motto for hiring. Yeah. Um, some, it sounds like some of you had the opportunity to take entrepreneurship classes as part of formal education. Outside of that, how would you recommend learning more about becoming an entrepreneur? Don't be a spectator, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took the entrepreneurial class. It was really great, but that uh, motivated me to drop out. So <laughs> 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 Because I felt that I would learn much more if I would actually start my own business than if I were to learn theoretically, right? And uh, especially in these classes, like they are great if, um, say, you want to start a company in, say, two years, but I wanted to start a company, like I had already started a company, basically, and everything that they were that was being taught there was great knowledge, but it was not aligning with what I wanted to do at that point in my company's journey. So um, yeah, take it, take them with a grain of salt. Um, there are a lot of free resources available as well. For example, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm in Y Combinator, that's why I'm mentioning YC, but it's not like you just have to listen to YC's uh, videos or like uh, startup school uh, written material, uh, uh, et cetera. But yeah, there's a lot of free resources available. Uh, but you learn the best when you'll actually do them. Uh, so yeah, that's basically my advice there. Yeah, so there's a book called Disciplined Entrepreneurship by yeah. Bill Allett. Um, I think that's a good reference. Um, and then like we do everything crawl, walk, run. So to, to your point, um, uh, sell something, figure out just well, the smallest, tiniest thing <laughs> you can get all the way from you acquired a uh, customer, you delivered the product, you got them to rate it, you know, all the way end to end. And yeah, that'll be a great experience. And then you just basically apply that blueprint to whatever business you want to do later, um, I think. There's also just... I, I always wish I had done this. You never take the perfect pathway, um, but if I had tried to do a perfect pathway to where we are, I would have worked at a VC for three months, uh, an internship or something, to see that side, because you spend so much of your life fundraising as a founder. And um, I would have worked at CMMI or uh, like a, basically a health insurance company to understand how all the money works in healthcare um, before starting this company. But um, yeah. yeah, I think I have similar ideas. Um, I, I think, let's see, uh, in terms of how to, I, I think a lot of it can be learned as you go, like, and uh, maybe this is just my approach to school as well, but a lot of you can like see online and you take the class and you're like, okay, this is how I file taxes and this is how, you know, this is like the basics of how you price your product and, and you, a lot of it, there's awesome YC videos, this one entrepreneurship is really good. Um, I, I think for me, there are, there were sort of like three like core things that I think comes into being a technical founder. Like there's like the basic technical skills, can you build like products, do you, like, you know, know how to do that or have some familiarity with that. There's selling the product, um, which was, that was not my strength. And so I think that was something like trying to get used to putting myself out there, selling things in general, selling my, you know, my surf meetup <laughs> or other things. Um, and I think, and then the other thing I think is, is it's sort of like leadership and, and learning, like, it's not what you need to do day one, but I think it'll make a really big difference, like year, year two. Uh, and so in that, I think you can, you don't have to take a class or having even someone teach it to you. I think that's something like you, you're working in an organization now, you see what leaders you like and like just putting thought into like, 
what do they do that I think is working well? Like, what are the problems in my organization? And what what does my organization do really well? And I think that you can, like, just, you know, a lot of these, I think, just by, like, talking to people, asking questions and, like, reflecting on, like, what's going well for other people and what's going wrong, I think you can get to. Oh, I'll just go first, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question, like, you mentioned like you met your co-founders when you were working and all, but you, you might have had this idea of, okay, I want to start something like this. How long you were surfing on that idea and were you also looking at other ideas or other opportunities? Okay, you spend a little time, you do research and then you think, oh, maybe this might not work. Maybe I have to think it in a different way. So like how long, I, I feel like this is kind of a research thing where you basically start your own company or your, your own organization before that you do. So like, how long you were in that period? So um, I didn't think about my application. So I was, it was a few years later after I was diagnosed with melanoma that I was like, I need a thesis topic. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't the origin, I guess. Um, but then the, the, the semester before I'd taken New Enterprises and we did like a project on if you could scan receipts from the grocery store and see like pricing for grocery, you know, and like cost savings and uh, it was a computer vision application. And then previously I was working with a startup um, that was like helping be managers be better managers by helping them like schedule one-on-ones and another one that was like you stick a probe into snow to see if there's a likelihood of avalanches. So just try, did random stuff and worked with different teams and figured out what it's like to work with a team, what it's like to sort of figure out where your customers are and all this stuff, and then applied those learnings um, later. So I don't, um, but certainly learned a lot about team dynamics in the, in the process. This was not my idea, so I'll let them speak to theirs. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for me, uh, we were working on a different idea when both of us realized that the current idea that we're working on is what we are most passionate about. So um, I would say the idea was in front of us for a really long time, but we pursued it eventually. So um, yeah, that's one thing. The other thing I would say is companies pivot a lot. Uh, so what I mean by that is they start with one idea, they, f they uh, as Susan mentioned, they go out and try to sell it, and they realize that there was, you know, it, it at, in early days it's so amorphous, even though you think that you have the idea nailed down, you realize that uh, this particular piece of it is resonating well, or maybe I'm not the right person to be building this sort of company. You either do a hard pivot, which is like, say you move from machine learning to Web3, Completely. Or you open a clinic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, it, it's different for every company. And yeah, product market fit, founder market fit, most yeah. importantly. Our first version was, what if I could take a photo of a mall and understand what it is as a patient? And then it was, um, what if I can take large field photos of the body and like do mall monitoring over time and identifying ugly duckling? And then it was what, how, how we can help patients with genital skin issues understand what's going on with their own uh, skin and connect to a provider, especially if they're embarrassed or shy or want it to be private. And then it was helping every doctor have the expertise of a dermatologist. And we've very recently evolved to we're delivering the care and using AI internally. But it's been a lot of different permutations and like, what does the market want? Like, how do we fit into the current healthcare system? What are we good at? All that stuff. Thank you. I have a question um, about, you know, dealing with failure and resiliency. You talked about as a startup, you run up against a lot of walls, and I'm sure you can't, you know, handle all the balls in the air. So. What are some um, ways that you pick yourself up after uh, a failure, and how do you maintain and inspire that confidence in your investors and, and make them put in more money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, I love this question. I think that, it, like, failure is how we get better, and it's how... And, and so to some extent, I think, you know, I, I, I've been trying to retrain my perspective so that, you know, any failure, like, any issue or, or you know, we prepare and try not to fail, but, like, any issue we encounter now is actually, like, such a, a gift because we'll learn and, like, we're going to grow as a team and as founders so that when we're, like... 10x bigger hopefully soon and it matters more you know than we know for that time and so I think for me like usually I'm going to be real like there's a second where you're like you know rage quit you like you know, rant to like my partner or like run or like go for a run or something and then I can they come back and then and, and I think I, I try to tell myself like it, it's an incredible sort of gift and opportunity to have the ability to found your own company and try to you know make make an impact where you know we are, while, you know while we have runway and stuff like that and so really trying to focus on, on making the most of it. Like, what did I learn here? How do, like, how do I do better next time? And, and there are so many opportunities. Like, like you're saying, there's, there's like the macro pivots of like now we're a different company, but there's also the micro, there's so many approaches to solve your problem. There's like, do we need a new technical solution? There's like thousands of those. Do we need to find a partner who can, partner company can help, help us do part of the solution and we take the other? Can we find like a new type of customer or like talk to someone who can connect us with new customers? So there's so many like, opportunities to solve your problems that usually like after I have a second to like cool off and then I'm like okay back at it <laughs> yeah I would say founders generally have uh, either they have or they build a really strong emotional intelligence because every single day there are like hundreds of fires going on around your startup like there is something or the other breaking and uh, you have to learn to live with it uh, so generally, you become very um, hard skinned, or like in sales, people usually say that you become more shameless, <laughs> uh, um, as as in like you 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 don't get too bogged down by every new potential customer saying you know. Um, yeah, it, yeah, that's basically what I would say. Um. It's hard and you get better at it. Uh, but I think, yeah, there are a million failure opportunities. I'd say for me at least, like, even if it's a hard day at work, like your bank collapses. Um, <laughs> no one's reading the news. OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like it's only three of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still have, like, whatever it is running, and you can see if you if you show up for running that you're getting faster or whatever and so like a little bit of diversifying your life a bit um, um, making sure you have those down times and then for me one of the reasons improv is great is I can't be focused on whatever is in the future I can't be dwelling on what happened that day I have to be listening and responding and hearing everything that was said and making decisions and people have various versions of that, meditation, running, et cetera, um, surfing, because you can't have your phone. I do some of my best thinking when I'm brushing my teeth, because I can't have <laughs> my phone. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just like, is is partially diversification, partially understanding yourself. And like, like for me, I don't take meetings before 1 p.m. in general. Sometimes I do, but um, most of the time I don't. Because, like, a, a rejection from an investor can, like, if I can just jump into another meeting, I'll be fine. Um, but the context switching, and it's just a bummer. And so I make sure I need I get my thing I need to get done before 1 p.m. And then I can do all the meetings I need to do. And even if I get flustered by it, it's not impacting me getting that one thing done. Awesome. Yeah, thank you ladies for sharing your journey and hope it was inspirational to all of you.